Challenge is really about uncovering the creative side of technology. We are really excited to see what people will come up with, considering that this is a common challenge and there's a wide variety of disciplines. So it's not restricted to technology people, but you've got people from different backgrounds. Creativity is also a way for people who don't think of themselves as being involved in technology to be part of that conversation. And you know what? That's a little hint of what we've to come in 24 hours from now as we reveal the winners of the Digital Creative Challenge. That's Friday afternoon, along with the launch of the Jersey Tech Awards. For now, good afternoon. My name is Gary Burgess. It's lovely to have your company once again, and welcome back to Jersey Tech Week. I make it Thursday afternoon. I've run out of fingers and thumbs to work out what session we're up to, but I do know this afternoon we are talking about all things creative. Let me just give you a little idea about what's on the menu for us during the course of the next couple of hours, because I think you will like this. In just a moment, we're going to be hearing from Daniel Rolls from Target Internet, who's also the founder of the Digital Leadership Programme. He'll be talking a bit more about what we spoke about this morning, the digital skills crisis and shortage, and what we can do about that. That. And then a little bit later, we'll be catching up with Stefan Toma, a Google alumni who knows everything there is to know about learning and innovation. So looking forward to hearing from Stefan a little bit later on. And then I'm going to bring the pair of them together for a Q&A. So if you've got any questions during the course of this afternoon, let us know and we can put those to the panel a bit later on. For now, though, Daniel, lovely to see you here. Raring to go. It's over to you. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, uh, we're going to talk digital creatives and uh, I'm going to be here to introduce Stefan Toma. So we'll get to Stefan in a moment, we've just got 10 minutes of me and I want to talk to you about the digital skills crisis, but actually why that's an opportunity as well. So I'll start by putting some of those things that Gary mentioned into context about who I am and what I do, and that will lead us into the challenges we're going to face and actually what we can do about them as well. So on a day by day basis, I run a company called Target Internet. And we work with all the brands that you can see on the screen here, helping them improve the skills of their teams and working through their digital marketing, working on the digital transformation and various other digital words. But in reality, it's about getting them fit for the environment they're working in, in this fast changing environment. Um, I'm also a program director at Imperial College. So Imperial College, uh, you can see some of my lovely MSc students here. Unfortunately, not allowed to stand this close to each other at the moment. Uh, but essentially what we're doing there is the digital marketing MSc program and then I head up the digital transformation program as well. Now, I mentioned this because we're going to come to research that we've done from Imperial College around digital transformation and what that means in terms of skills uh, in just a moment as well. And then the digital leadership program was mentioned. Well, that's something we've started here in Jersey and, and it's a two year alternative to a standard undergraduate route through university. And this is very much about focusing on things like tech, uh, but also very much looking at creative skills, leadership skills, entrepreneurship as well. So bringing together those people that can be problem solvers. And then finally, um, I do something called the Digital Marketing Podcast. This is again about getting people's skills up to date, but in a format they can listen to when they're on the move or when they're sitting in front of their computers. And then I've written books on the topic, but the problem with books is by the time they're published, they're nine months out of date. So that's why I'm not going to try and sell you a book today. Uh, the reality is, though, the research we do for these books then feeds into everything else. So what have all these things got in common and what does this mean to us in context? So basically, technology is driving constant change. It's a fast changing business and personal environment, but businesses and skills are not keeping pace. So let's put that in perspective a little bit. If we talk about digital transformation. What is it? Well, it's basically saying, where are we now? And where do we need to be in order to keep up with this fast changing environment? Now, that sounds like you're going to go through a series of changes and that's going to lead you to be transformed. Everything's done and we can finish and we can move on with things as normal. The reality is that actually what we're doing is getting our organizations ready for constant change. 
So digital transformation is the process of getting ready for that constant change. And then we need to keep up to date with that ongoing. So that means that our organizations need to constantly innovate. And it also means that we need to be constantly learning. So those two things are very much what Stefan is going to be talking to us about. Now, let's look at a practical application of this and, and how this works in the real world for our job roles every day. We work with the Chartered Institute of Marketing to produce something called the Digital Skills Benchmark. And what that basically did is say, let's not ask people's opinions of their skills, but let's actually go through and test their skills. So we've had over 5,000 people now go through and basically what's quite a challenging test of asking where their skills are uh, within digital marketing, entrepreneurship, leadership and various other areas. And then we've gone through and judged how successful they are against the benchmark. So basically we can say, what's your confidence? What's your ability? So low confidence, low ability, that's fine. We'll, we'll help you train up. Uh, low confidence, high ability, we need to boost your confidence. High confidence, low ability, well, you're a bit of a liability to be honest, and we need to identify those people in our organizations. So we can benchmark the skills and the results are very, very telling. So I just wanted to show you the results that we got back in May and to share some of those with you. And that will kind of show the challenge that you're facing. So what you've got on the circle here is lots of different disciplines in this particular case with digital marketing. And you can see at the outer rims of that circle, that's if our knowledge was perfect. In blue is where we are generally at the moment. So there is this skills gap. OK, we can kind of see that we all probably acknowledge that. The reality is it's probably worse than we thought it was uh, in terms of where skills are. But what's interesting is we did this two years ago and we've just done it again now. And what we can actually see is the skills in a lot of cases are static. They haven't improved, but actually in some cases they've gone backwards. So why is that? Why has we gone through two years of talking about skills and universities improving things and people like the Chartered Institute of Marketing trying to create better training? Well, it hides a bigger picture. And I'll, I'll just talk about that. So why it's gone backwards is that fundamentally the consumer, those customers that we deal with, their expectations have changed. So what happens is that you are expecting when you phone that call center, they know what you did on the website. When you use the app, they expect it to load quickly and, and work effectively. When you use the website, it should be absolutely seamless. It should be a frictionless journey. Nothing should get in the way. So our expectations have changed, but actually organizations haven't kept pace with that and our skills haven't kept pace. So fundamentally, if you learned something two years ago, if you haven't kept up skilling, actually your skills have fallen behind. So we need to make sure that our skills are going in the right direction. Now some hidden things within this data. New entrants into the workplace. They are better skilled than they were ever before. Universities and other training organizations are doing a better job and they're keeping their courses more up to date. Senior people, the kind of directors, are doing a slightly better job, um, but that's from a very, very low base. So we did some work with the Institute of Directors, looking at where the skills of directors are in terms of digital. It was pretty bad, but that is starting to be addressed. So it's improving, but from a very low base. The problem we've got is in the middle. We've got people that are in management roles. They're probably in head of department roles. They've done their training. They've learned their skills. And then fundamentally, They've gone into a role, they're not doing this stuff anymore, but they're managing other people that are, and they're not training anymore. And that means their skills are getting behind and they don't necessarily know the right questions to ask. So we've got challenges and let's, let's kind of bring back together the quote we just looked at. So technology is driving constant change, but this isn't necessarily about technology. This is about that constant changing environment. So it's a fast changing business environment and personal environment, but that means our businesses and skills are not keeping pace. How do we address that? Well, that's why Stefan's here. Uh, Stefan is an expert in all things in terms of skills, in terms of innovation. Um, you'll hear about his past at Google, but he also does a lot of other amazing things as well. So it's a real pleasure to have Stefan here. Stefan has come in and spoken to my students at the Digital Leadership Programme before. They were all blown away by his knowledge. So I'm very pleased to welcome him uh, onto the stage today and hand over to Stefan and I'll be back later on uh, to answer some questions as well. So welcome, Stefan. Thank you very much for being here and I'll hand over you to introduce yourself. Lovely. 
Um, so thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for those kind words as well, Daniel. I'm, 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 I'll do my best to live up to the billing. But um, so yes, I'm Stefan, Stefan Toma. I'm delighted to be here this afternoon and to um, to join you all in the cloud. Um, so thanks so much for inviting me. Um, mainly, um, I wanted to share some insights. Uh, so some insights into how to run a business, how to create an environment where we really get the most out of our employees and specifically the kind of digital creatives that um, that now populate our organization. I think um, Gallup recently po uh, published a study. I've got it here in front of me. In five years time, millennials and Gen Zs will make up over 75% of the workplace. So really creating the kind of conditions and climate and environment where digital creatives can really thrive um, is really going to be one of the key determinants of success. So what I want to do was, was share some insights and share some stories um, around how other companies have done that. Now, uh, why I might have something to say about that um, is um, because um, I've worked for Google for about eight years or so, um, but I've been in tech for about 20, 25 years. Um, so my role at Google was to be the what was framed as the internal learning and development director um, for the global uh, organization, part of the people ops team. I spent about eight years in Google, but before that I've worked for a succession of US tech companies of one sort or another. Um, so, um, Nowadays, uh, I left Google after about eight years. I was there in the period uh, that it scaled from about 5,000 to about 45,000 people in, a, in about that seven and a half year period. Um, it was a really core central experience for me. I left six years ago um, and nowadays uh, I'm a consultant um, to small European companies, um, that um, tech companies that want to scale and grow um, and try and emulate some of the trajectory and success of Google. So um, the kind of organizations that I've worked with um, in more recent years, uh, probably about 50 or 60 in total here are some examples, perhaps one or two of the better known brands. They range from companies on the left hand side that are you know, pretty well known scale ups of one sort or another, such as Monzo Bank and um, um, Cobalt Music and Deliveroo, um, Spotify. We'll come on to that or one or two of those in a moment. And also some larger traditional businesses that are really keen to do something serious um, and to create the right kind of conditions and climate nowadays. So that's me. So I've got a uh, kind of a, let's say, a formative experience from my, my just about eight years in Google. Um, and then all this stuff from these sorts of tech organizations more recently. Um, so out of all of that, um, what I wanted to do was I wanted to kind of set a little bit of context for this to start with, which is um, before I go into some of this, um, I think it's really important to say that there are no best practices. So it's not to say that Google serves as an example for what other companies should do and um, and lift and shift some of the kind of practices. And there are there are good practices in the Google context, things that worked in the culture and climate and how the business evolved, as there are in these other businesses as well. In fact, there are pretty good practices that still survive from some of these old traditional businesses. GE is a good example. Um, so we need to kind of harvest, we need to listen and harvest from the old world, um, the new world, the Googles, Facebooks, um, Twitters, the tech titans, the Amazons of this world, the new new. So the next gen companies, the scale ups and startups that are coming behind those folks. And, and I think uh, there are some companies that might argue, you know, that they've already got there. I'm not entirely convinced they have, but there are also some companies that really have transformed themselves. There's so much talk about digital transformation and so on of these old businesses or older businesses or more traditional businesses. Um, but I think some of those offer interesting cases as well. So. Um, with all of that, um, what I'd like to do really is um, take you through what happened in Google um, and how Google thought about its culture of innovation, how it kept those things alive as it as it scaled through this journey from being a tiny little organization to really being an at scale tech enterprise. Um, share some of that with you. Then I want to go into uh, a couple of examples from some of these next gen tech companies. Um, 
and then abstract back out with a few takeaways and then open it up for q and a it'd be super interesting to hear what what people want to deep dive or if you want to hear some more if you want to challenge as well um that's perfectly okay um so that's really the kind of root map for this um so let's uh, let's start um i want to kind of lay out the google picture and what we did to try and create the right kind of conditions and climate for digital creatives um so I think you all know the uh, the Google story, really. Um, you know, from two guys in a garage, um, two PhD uh, students at Stanford, Larry and Sergey, through about twenty years later, or to a company of over a hundred thousand Googlers, um, globally distributed. Um, so that kind of scaling and growth in approximately two decades is really an extraordinary story. Um, there are others, of course. Uh, Facebook would argue that in its earlier days, in its early days, that it scaled more rapidly than Google did. But I think there are very few other um, organizations that can um, that really can lay out that kind of a case. So Google, um, of course, through the years, um, brought a lot of products to market. Um, so here's a slide from a few years ago. Um, it went on, of course, after that, from the early days in 2000, the launch of AdWords, um, and the introduction every year of new products, new services, um, and so on. And of course, that path has continued through the years. So, you know, it's a story, although the bulk of its businesses, of course, is online advertising, uh, but it's still an ongoing story of innovation, both in that core product domain, but also in the adjacencies beyond that. So a story of continual kind of new products to market. Um, behind that, though, inside the organization was a much richer and vibrant scene. Here are some of the little icons um, uh, that uh, each one of these kind of products and services, of course, has. Um, so behind the scenes, behind what get, went out to the public um, and went out to users in alpha and beta pilots was a much richer and more vibrant product portfolio. Google is continually behind the scenes launching and testing products internally, some of which were evolutions and adaptations to core products, some of which were entirely new things. And of that much, much richer world and richer and more diverse set, some, of course, made it and made it through to um, beta in the outside world with users. Um, most of them didn't. Most of them essentially died, withered on the vine. The lessons were learned, incorporated in, into other products, and so the story went on. So there's the world outside of the products that you all know about and will have seen, but inside was this much richer and more dynamic and broader portfolio of nascent, rising, evolving, dying experiments and products. So how did that happen? How did Google kind of keep that alive from the early days and at scale? And there are some core cultural tenets, I think, or um, well, they're more than cultural, but core scaffolding is really the word I like to use, some core scaffolding that held this whole assemblage together. Um, so the first one, um, is around you know, innovation at scale. So you want to create an environment and a culture you know, where innovation can come from anywhere in the organization. Um, so innovation doesn't sit in a box in the corner or in an R&D lab. What Google really wanted to do was to encourage all its employees, Googlers, um, to use the language uh, that we used, um, to encourage all Googlers to innovate in their roles and to come up with new ideas and new initiatives, irrespective of where they sat in the teams um, or irrespective of where they sat in geographic locations. So you might be a software engineer, you might be a data analyst, you might be an online marketing exec, uh, you might be an HR person. It's part of your role and your job in this organization to push the needle and to try and do things um, in a more efficient, more effective, or totally new way altogether. So that requires, to make that really, these are easy words, but to make that really work, it requires a level of independence for Googlers to be able to operate freely. So I need to have a level of autonomy and freedom to be able to do that. Um, so it can't be too buttoned down, a prescriptive, hierarchical, I'm the boss, I tell you what to do type culture. They would kill it. 
Secondly, it needs some really vibrant climate of communication. So for that to work, people have to know what other people are working on and they need to share their knowledge and expertise, they need to share their insights, they need to share what's worked, what hasn't worked and so on. So we need strong communication, strong collaboration across the whole system, top down, bottom up and laterally as well, and open communication. So as the company grew, some of that scaffolding was really important to keep alive in the organization. Um, now, I want to share with you um, a, a, a bit, a, a kind of a couple of sentences from um, the IPO letter when the com company went public in 2014. So in other words, you know, so if you, so when, to 2004, excuse me. So if you want to invest in us, so this was in the IPO letter, don't expect us to do conventional things. You know, the nightmare for Google would be to become just another large megalithic organization. Um, and so they were very expli explicitly stating at that time, you know, we don't intend to become a, a conventional company. We want to do things differently. And specifically in here, you know, we want to create an at will retain uh, as we scale an atmosphere of creativity that I've talked about and challenge. So it's all very well to have a vibrant, creative environment where people come up with cool stuff and crazy ideas. They need to be challenged. So we need to create an environment also where on the one hand we foster creativity and innovation and people have autonomy, um, but we also need to have a, a climate where people will challenge one another. So actually, is this a good idea or not? Where's the, dis the data to support the hypothesis that you have that you're going to do deliver whatever product benefits or features or revenue or whatever KPIs you believe it will have? Where's the data to support that? Show me that will work. If you haven't got the data, you better go and get the data. But we w want challenge to people's hypotheses and assertions of what should be. So you have creativity and you have challenge. Now that challenge needs to be done um, in a positive and constructive way. This isn't about um, flaming people. Absolutely not. Destructive um, challenge is absolutely not what, what we want. Is is constructive. Um, challenge so that we can all work together and achieve a better aim overall. So creativity and challenge. Um, now, um, part of this also is um, the mission and purpose of the organization. So um, the this is a this is a screenshot of the London office um, and you know really, and that you can see what I've circled in the red down there, do cool things that matter. Um, this was really the internal mantra in the organization. Google had its external mission and purpose, you know, organize the world's information and make it universally accessible. And that was true as its guiding light. But really the message to Google as to its employees that what was important in this organization was to do cool things that matter. So do things that have some degree of um, differentiation that are engaging, that are interesting, that are useful, but have some purpose and and will make a difference. Um, so do cool things that matter. So Google was quite strong on making sure that people understood the mission and purpose of the organization. Now, if we take that down to the level below that, um, so if we think about business strategy then, so most organizations, of course, will have a business strategy um, and will have a multi-year view of where they want to go, um, maybe framed as a five-year plan, maybe if you're framed in a highly agile industry as a one to two-year plan or strategy, but still a business strategy with competitors and, and quarters five forces and all these sorts of things in there. Google didn't really think about it in that way. It didn't really have a business strategy as such. It had some strategic principles. Um, and some of the ones from the from the time uh, back in the day are listed here. So, you know, don't worry about the competition. Instead, bet on technical insights. Um, don't follow the competition. Um, and so a number of kind of almost high level strategic principles. And then within that then, um, will work and iterate to, to drive the train forwards. Um, so the analogy really is this analogy of a train on a train track, um, except for there is no train track. 
Instead, there's a guy on the front of the train laying down the next bit of track. So we're clear about our strategic principles, but what we're going to do is we're going to plan in the very near term where we're going to place our bets and where our priorities are and what we're going to work on as an organization. And then we're going to we're going to be able to move the track in one direction or another direction and pivot very, very rapidly as we go. And we'll come into the mechanism by which Google did that um, a little later. But the, the, the way business strategy worked, it was this very much iterative, agile, ongoing process. Um, so the right metaphor to think about business strategy for Google was this picture here with the train and the train track being laid right in front of it. Um, so compelling mission and purpose, um, how it thinks about kind of the long range. And then we come into the, the kind of conditions and climate in the organization. And I think Google's pretty well known for some of this stuff to intentionally create a pretty vibrant and rich culture uh, climate for its uh, for its employees um, and to go out of its way to do that. Um, Google's well known for its primary colors, lava lamps, bean bags, this kind of stuff. Um, and sometimes I hear the pushback that this is just like cutesy Americana and, um, and but it was done very, very intentionally. Um, and we'll come into that in 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 a moment. Um, but it was basically true. I mean, this was the kind of world Google uh, had inside its organization. Um, that picture there is a picture of recycled cable cars, telecabines in the Zurich office that it used for internal meeting rooms. Um, it's a picture of a Halloween party in one of the early days in one of the offices. Um, there's Alana, who used to be in my old team with her dog. Um, Google had bring your pets to work. Perfectly OK to have your dogs running around the office so long as they didn't bother anyone else. There were some caveats around it, but still bring your pets to work. Um, we had bring your parents to work days, you know, so your parents could hear a little bit about what on earth is going on inside the organization. Um, it was really encouraging a level of, of kind of like almost intimacy. So, so come and be and share, you know, come and be your true authentic self in this environment at work. Um, so I wanted to um, show you, you've heard a little bit of that from me. I wanted to show you um, a video clip from those days that I think will speak to a bit of this. Um, so can we roll this video clip, please? Google is kind of a unique company for me and for, I think for a lot of people that work there. What Google does is it allows you a fantastic environment to be innovative and to get your product developed really quickly. It is a very different structure than the rest of the engineering community. We always really try to avoid bureaucracy so that people can really do what makes sense in their project. One thing that's great about Google is that you have a lot of autonomy over your product and its directions. We're encouraged to work on whatever we think is important. Often the best ideas come from employees. At Google, if you come in in your first week and you have a good idea on how things should be done and people agree with you, in that first week you can start making those changes. The biggest resource is definitely the people. One of the things that attracted me to Google and makes it a very comfortable place is they hire people who are very good. I think Google goes after people that are entrepreneurial, that are uh, kind of go-getters. Everyone in the company is just so accessible and everyone's really driven to make the company succeed. No two employees will have had the same background. There's no formula. We have people straight out of college. We have people who've been in the industry for 25 years. The concentration of talent that we have at Google is really quite amazing. I come to work and I look forward to the conversation I'm going to have during the day with my colleagues and with people I haven't met yet within the company because I know that today I'm going to find five new great ideas that I'm going to get excited about. We have yoga, we have Pilates. I love massages, I'm a spa queen. Let me mention the food. The food here, by the way, is great. We have uh, a French lunch where we get together and we speak French. We have the great cafeterias. There's any type of amazing cuisine, even better than some of the restaurants in New York. That's an extra benefit and pretty nice. You know that what you're working on will be seen by millions and millions of people. And when you have that kind of visibility. You're in a position to make a difference to people that you've never met. It's something that uh, makes it just fun to go to work in the morning because you're thinking about the people that you're going to talk to, the problems that you're going to try to tackle and solve. 
so it's really a great place to work. So <laughs> maybe a bit of a bit of a propaganda reel for, for Google there, but um, there's two reasons that I wanted to show that clip. One is that it really illustrates some of what I've talked about and what we tried to do inside the organization in the early days and keep alive as the company grew. But secondly, I'm going to show you another clip later on um, in this in this session um, from a European um, successful European scale up. And I, it, I wanted to show you this because what I'm going to ask you to do is to contrast it with the video later on at SoundCloud, um, uh, the Berlin based um, music um, startup or scale up now. Um, but that's the kind of a sense of the kind of environment that we had and the kind of the vibe that we had with our office workers and we wanted to keep alive as the as the company grew. So let's unpack this a little bit and come to some of the components of this. Now let's start with where it ended on that clip. The whole thing about free food and the um, and the working environment um, that and I said it earlier on the thing about the primary colors and lava lamp and informality and table football tables and you see this in so many um, tech companies nowadays. You know, at one, at one level, people do it because it's the industry norm and that's what we kind of are supposed to do nowadays. Um, but that's not why Google did it. Google did it in the early days because it had a strong belief that the physical environment should be the manifestation of the kind of culture that you want. So the physical environment acts as an amplifier, acts as, as a messenger of what's important in this organization culturally. So in other words, informality, sparkiness, um, uh, some vibrancy in the organization. Um, and then secondly, the free food thing is really interesting. Um, I mean, it's a great benefit. You don't, you know, you have free food if you work for Google, but that's not the reason the company did it. The reason the company did it was they wanted to create the spaces and places where people would interact and have serendipitous conversations that they wouldn't ordinarily have. So one of the classic stories of this is how Gmail happened and the the anecdote or that kind of you know that kind of um, the folklore is that the origins of Gmail were a, a software engineer sitting down at one of these lunch tables with somebody from corporate services, a, um, a finance guy or something like this, and the finance guy complaining about Microsoft Outlook and the inability to find uh, anything on their folders overflowing and so on at the time. And, um, and the Software engineer said, "Well, this is just ridiculous. I mean, we have a certain we have a search algorithm. What, what would happen if we applied the search algorithm to email?" And and out of that kind of a half moment, uh, Gmail was born, or Caribou, as we originally called the Alpha Pilot inside the organization. Um, and those kind of serendipitous conversations that wouldn't ordinarily happen was really the reason that there was free food that there were micro kitchens spaced out. Um, there were guidelines around how far away anybody, any employee should be from the micro kitchen places where they would have to get, have to refuel and so on. So there's bees around a honey pot. What's interesting, of course, this year was with COVID and the virtual world that we're now living in is what are you going to do in that world now to keep that kind of dynamic alive? But perhaps that's something we can come to in the Q&A space at the end. So the physical environment was really, really super important. Um, and then there were some really strong kind of like cultural kind of messages that we really wanted everybody to, to understand. Um, I mean, it was an American company, so these were framed in perhaps in slightly American ways. Um, and these are perhaps um, three of the most important ones of them. Um, there was a phrase that we used a lot inside Google, which is you can be serious without a suit. Um, and that didn't really mean what you know your physical clothing or what you wore. Although um, Google didn't mind, so long as you didn't offend anybody. If you really wanted to show up in a suit or a dinner jacket or some beach shorts or whatever, that's entirely up to you. Whatever you feel you're comfortable in and you want to be you know, your true authentic self so long as it doesn't offend anybody else um, but it's not really at that level what it really is it's much more profound than that so to be serious without a suit this is really about leadership at all, all levels it's not the big guys in the suits at the top of the organization it's really we expect everyone in this organization to have some vo voice and what's important in the organization is 
people's cognitive ability, um, their analytical rigor that they have, their ability to um, put together a, a, a hypothesis and argument to be able to demonstrate it with, with data and to be able to push back. So just because I'm a senior leader or manager in the organization doesn't mean I necessarily call the shots. I remember um, Google hired, he was my boss for a while, a guy called Laszlo Bock, who was a, came in to head the HR function, uh, people operations as it was called. And uh, he got a very early lesson. He designed a new system um, and um, uh, launched it on the organization and received a tremendous level of pushback, specifically from the software engineers and uh, the product guys around both the intellectual veracity of it, um, some of the technical systems, uh, problems with it. And he, he was flamed with this big reaction from employees, which was a real shock to him on joining the organization from where he was previously. Um, and it was that kind of vibrancy and pushback. So it's okay. In fact, we want people to, um, to be serious, to be able to indulge in serious conversations um, it's not just the senior people in the organization who are going to call the shots and make the decisions. So you can be serious without a suit, um, plus this kind of small company feel. So accessibility, it's OK to and people should be approachable. We're not going to have bosses in offices with closed doors. Um, we're not going to have in, even with virtual closed doors. And we expect people to engage and to interact across the organization. Um, so you can be serious without a suit. And what's really important is people's thinking skills and analytical skills. Um, then the second one is around um, the fast beat the slow. So this very strong belief in um, launch and iterate. And um, Google had this phrase of dog fooding, which again, particularly some Europeans react to a little bit as an American phrase. You know, it's far better to eat your, your own dog food um, before you try and inflict it on someone else. Um, so if you're launching a new product to the outside world, then the organization needs to use it first itself and try it out itself, um, collect the feedback and iterate before you take it elsewhere. Um, and so, so first of all, we need to try it ourselves and use it ourselves. And secondly, speed to market is really, really important. So don't wait to get a perfect solution. When you've got an MVP, um, take it out, gain the feedback and iterate. So the fast beat is slow. And the third kind of component here, which is probably one of the ones that Google is best known for, is this notion of 20% projects. So the idea that engineers, specifically engineers, um, but engineers could pursue 20% of their time on non-core role, work role projects. So day a week, we want you to do and we expect you to do other stuff. Um, now, this is quite contentious, really. Um, so but critically important. So, so let's go a little bit further into this 20% time. Um, I mean, in reality, it's a bit misunderstood. In reality, it was much more like 20% permission. Um, so it's about freedom rather than necessarily time in the way you know we're going to account for it as a day a week or anything like that. that's not really what it's about you know we hire you in a role to do x y and z that's great that's your core role um but if, but we can't you know it's okay to work on other stuff and in fact we want you to work on other stuff i remember there was somebody in my old team who for for family reasons was really deeply passionate about um the development of the economy in sub-Saharan Africa and wanted to get involved in a, the project to roll out um, um, broadband internet access in, in that region. And as her boss, I mean, it's nothing to do with her role at all, um, but as her boss, well, I wouldn't say no anyway, but even if I was an evil boss and, and, and so there's no way you need to focus on your core role, she could put her hands up and say, well, terribly sorry, Stefan, I'm going to be doing this. So. This 20% permission, it's okay. In fact, we want to encourage you to work on other stuff. And you have to trust people to make that work. I mean, generally, you know, coders write code, they don't write novels. Um, and you have to trust and, and, and people will generally do stuff in pursuit of what the company is trying to do or technology. Some people will do some crazy other stuff, um, but you have to trust people. There's a really nice quote here from 
a Swiss guy, Boaz Holtz. Um, he still is in Google. He, um, Swiss guy, he moved to California. He runs Google's, he's this very senior person now, he runs Google's data centers around the world, which is, you know, 20% is the best educational program a company can have. You know, you give people the permission and freedom to experiment and to work on other things and to learn the lessons and to share that with others. Um, so 20% time um, is a really important cultural tenant. I remember in the big downturn in um, 2008 and 2009, when a lot of companies, uh, of course, hit the recession, it affected Google as well. Um, and there was a real moment of truth then where it would have been quite easy to say, scrap 20% time. Actually, if we scrap 20% time, we have an additional 20% capacity. So we don't need to hire people until we catch the lag, make up that lag of that 20%. Um, we can use that buffer to get on with our core work. Um, and that was a real moment of truth. Google decided not to do that in the end. If it had done it, um, it would have really been, I think, a significant turning point. It wouldn't have lived up to that. We're not going to be a conventional com uh, company mantra in the IPO letter of years earlier. So 20% time, fundamentally important to provide a bit of capacity in the system for this creativity and innovation that I talked about. That's what it's premised on. However, you can't have people doing this all the time and you give me permission to do this. So it was coupled with another piece of scaffolding, which was a thing called 70-20-10, which is essentially, you can think about 70-20-10 at a business level, at a team level, at a personal level. And it's really portfolio management. Where are you spending your time? Where are you spending your resources? Resources in its broadest sense. So as a company, it might be people, it might be money, it might be machine time. At a personal level, it's time. Where am I spending my time? And the framework is, you know, you should be spending about 70% of your time on whatever it is you do, your core products and services and providing, you know, excellence in those core products and services. You should be spending about 20% of your time on improvements to the better, faster, cheaper, um, and so on. And about 10% on the the really new stuff so innovation and creativity on new projects new programs and so as google started as it as it thought about how to feed projects and resources at, um, and where to apply headcount where to apply money and so on applied the 70 20 10 principle and applied it right down to an individual level as well so on the one hand you've got this 20 percent time and freedom and i can do cool things. And on the other hand, you've got this, this drive to throttle innovation. And there's a nice quote from Marissa, Marissa Meyer. Um, she's quite well known now. She was a PM back in the days in Google um, and famously went on to become the CEO of Yahoo and tried to turn Yahoo around. Um, it's a nice quote, which is, you know, creativity loves constraints. If it was an unconstrained environment, well, first of all, it would be abject chaos. But secondly, you need some constraints because that forces you to think differently, to take a step back from problems and think differently. So we have 20% time and we have 70, 20, 10. Um, and then it went a bit further. Um, so, um, and it went a bit further and Google has become well known for um, 10X thinking or moonshots and the moonshot factory. And this was an evolution from some of that stuff that was on the earlier slide um, and the anecdote goes that um, it was then Larry who is now at this stage now CEO um, Larry Page um, got fed up with a yet another project proposal or initiative that delivered incrementalist gain so another two three four five percent revenue or customer service or user adoption or latency or whatever so you know i've had enough of this kind of you know incrementalist 10 percent thinking what would it be like if you thought 10x instead of 10 percent and out of that then came this thing this 10x thinking move and so the challenge back into the organization was you know don't you dare come up with some ideas or some thinking that is incrementalist unless you also deliver alongside it some 10x ideas. 
So it was kind of institutionalized. So you needed to have some 10x ideas to sit alongside your, let's say, your business plan and your and your regular thinking. Um, most of those ideas, of course, were just crazy. Um, but every so often, every so often, a nugget would come along. Um, every so often, a really cool idea, a transformative notion that we wouldn't really have come across otherwise. And so 10x and 10x thinking and moonshots um, became also then part of the culture and part of the climate. Now, how does all this then happen? So I come up with an idea, lovely. Um, 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 in my part of my 20% time, what do I do with it? And how does that then scale and how do I develop momentum behind it? So it needs to iterate fast. If it's a lousy idea, it needs to be killed quite quickly. The lessons learned and shared and we move on. If actually it has some merit, it needs to scale and um, either be integrated with other things or scale and fed quite quickly. So what's critically important when I come up with a great idea or a notion is to find my first follower, is to find someone else who will think, hmm, that's pretty interesting. I'd like to partner with you. I'd like to do a bit of my 20% time uh, working with you on this. And so you start to scale it up and build communities and start to integrate some of these things. And there are some, some mechanisms to help make that happen. Google ran tech talks where engineers or anybody really inside the organization would come and present their ideas, um, their propositions, what work they've done, what R&D, what research, what data they had to the scrutiny of their peers. So the model was almost like an academic peer review process. And through that then, these ideas started to get, um, started to aggregate. And then at a certain point, of course, um, then the company, if something reached critical mass and was interesting enough, then the company would feed it, would provide resources um, to, to the project. Um, but the key thing is to fail fast and fail early, share the, le less, learn, share, you know, uh, share the learnings with others and move on and not to stigmatize. Um, so it's okay if your idea actually isn't, doesn't have the merit in relation to other ideas. It's not a negative thing. So that's some of the cultural scaffolding there. Um, what I'd like to do now is then take you into a little bit of how it thought of more specifically about people. Um, and um, this slide here kind of says it all. Um, this is a slide from um, that my old boss used, um, Laszlo, Laszlo Bock, at a big conference in the States a few years ago, where these other companies showed up with them. 40 slide decks of their wonderful approach to their people strategy um, and so on. And uh, Laszlo showed up with one slide, which was, you know, if you give people freedom, they will amaze you. So we need to design our kind of people systems around that premise. If we give people freedom, they'll amaze you. We need to trust them. We need to give them feedback. We need to coach them. But essentially, we need, we want to unlock people's creativity and freedom um, in the organization. Nice words. Um, in practice, it thought about it in a, against a framework. It's quite a simple framework. Framework was, what are we going to do to find them? What are we going to do to find best and brightest in the marketplace? What are we going to do to grow them, to really make sure that they have a rich and fulfilling time here, both in the work that they do, um, but also in their growth and career. Um, and what are we going to do to keep them um, and to retain them and keep engagement high in the organization? And what I'll do is I want to take you through a little bit of each one of these things. So um, on the find them, first of all, um, I mean, attraction of people was the kind of cornerstone. So Google worked hard um, to become one of the best companies to work for over the years. Um, it won best company to work for or Fortune 100 in here or CNN um, because of the way it treated its employees. So, so it worked hard to build that kind of condition and climate that would be a talent magnet for the organization. Um, and the premise was really, you know, so if we do that, we need to set the bar high and we want to really make sure that we hire 
best and brightest. So the bar was intentionally set high. It's tough to get into Google. Um, and learning and growth is just part of the part of the deal, really. Um, the other notion that's really critically important in this was the bar is set high, but we want to treat everybody like their top talent. I mean, many organizations, you know, kind of like have the special ones, have the ones that are top talent or high potentials or however they call it. Google didn't want to do that. It didn't want to put people on a pedestal and say, well, you're better than the others. So we'll focus on the 10 percent, but essentially disenfranchise the 90 percent. We start with the premise. We set the bar high. Everybody's top talent that comes through the door, and that's how we're going to treat you in the organization. Um, and so the hiring process, of course, um, um, sought to do that, sought to deliver best and brightest in the marketplace, irrespective of role, whether it's a straight grad from the university or an experienced uh, leader. The way it did it in the hiring process was um, there were four hiring criteria. Google hired specifically for four things. One of which is the obvious thing, um, which is role related expertise, whatever it is you need in the role, whether it's coding skills or you're a product guy or, or a finance analyst, whatever those role related expertise, which of course every company um, um, looks for in an interview process. The second one was uh, general cognitive ability. We hired explicitly for people's cognitive ability and the interview process would test for that. Um, uh, so people's ability to use data, to be able to synthesize data, to be able to abstract from that, um, their analytical reasoning skills, irrespective of the role. Um, of course, there were different standards and benchmarks depending on the type of role and the seniority. But GCA, general cognitive ability, was a specific hiring attribute. Um, the third one was leadership. Um, and again, for all roles. Um, and leadership is defined by two things, really. Um, so remember what I said about followers and needing to be able to develop your first follower. Um, so this is not leadership in the traditional hierarchical sense. It's your ability to engender followership in others. So if I have a great idea um, or you know, I have a worthy cause, can I get other people to mobilize behind that? And is there evidence to suggest that I've done that, even if I'm a straight grad? So in what I've done in my academic or, or college days or in my hobbies and pastimes or pursuits and passions that I'm interested in. Um, so leadership is defined as followership. Can you engender followers in others? Um, and then secondly, leadership defined as, well, have you taken a stand? Have you put your head above the parapet? Um, have you taken a position on the stand against something that you felt passionately about? And, and how did you do that? And how did you handle that situation? Um, so, so leadership in a very nuanced kind of a way um, and applied to all roles. So role related expertise, general cognitive ability, leadership. And the fourth one is the most intangible hiring attribute, um, which was cultural fit. Um, or as it was called, googliness. So does this person have the right kind of cultural fit or googliness in the organization? Um, Eric Schmidt, who was the CEO and became chair um, for a while, chairman, um, framed it as the LAX test, LAX as the airport, Los Angeles airport. So if you were stuck with this individual, Mr. Plain for eight hours at LAX. Is this the kind of person that you'd be interested to be stuck with? Do they have something interesting to say? Do they have some color and interest about their life? What's different about them? Are they, you know, how can how, they're not just some mediocre anodyne, another, you know, kind of, you know, is there something that really sets them apart from the others? So Googling is defined in that way. Googling is also defined in terms of cultural fit in this kind of environment of high levels of autonomy, creativity, plus challenge. Are you willing to stand up and to push back and to string an argument together with others? So those are the four hiring attributes. Um, and then the way Google's interview process um, is pretty well known, um, but just some kind of features um, of it. Um, so 
only hire A plus candidates. So you know, as a hiring manager, don't you dare, don't you dare hire a B player or a C player. You will only hire the best and brightest. Um, it's far better to wait six months, 12 months, 18 months to find the right person rather than compromise and take a suboptimal candidate. Um, the tendency is, of course, to take somebody like quickly and consequently hiring managers were disempowered. Um, the one example of a kind of like a big bureaucratic process in Google, if I wanted to hire somebody, I couldn't do it. I would have to submit my rationale for why I wanted to hire somebody to the scrutiny of my peers. Um, so in other words, a hiring committee of others, I would make the case, but the others would decide whether this person met the criteria and really was an A plus candidate. It was quite painful for hiring managers, but it really drove objectivity. Um, and it also, back in those days before, well, it was awakening already, I was about to say before DEI and became such a big agenda for organizations. It was an early, um, an early mechanism to make sure that we drove diversity um, into the organization as well. Um, and specifically cognitive diversity. So different thinking styles and approaches. So you have this 360 panel who did the interviews. Um, boss, obviously peers as well, but if there are junior people, then junior people would all, there would also be a junior people. So you'd have a 360 view of a candidate, submit a pack, hiring committee decides, that's how we maintain standards. So hiring was quite a process in Google to make sure we got the right people on the bus. Um, so that was the find them piece. Then once you've got them, well, then what are you going to do with them and how are you going to make this work? And specifically this environment of kind of like creativity and freedom. But still, the company wants to move in a certain direction. It's laid down the next bit of train on the train track. Um, and Google used a process that now is pretty well known. It wasn't Google's process. It actually came from Intel originally, which is OKRs and the OKR process. Um, so. Larry, Paige, and the, exec the senior folks would lay out the next bit of train on the train track, so the next quarter's OKRs, and cascade those. At the same time, individuals would frame their quarter's OKRs, what are the big objectives, and what are the key results, what are the outcomes that I want to work towards by the end of this quarter. So you have top-down OKRs coming, you have bottom-up OKRs coming from individuals, and the manager in the middle would intermediate and try and make those things fit together. This was the mechanism to throttle that innovation that I talked about. So if I want to work on something cool and different, I would frame it as an OKR for the quarter. I would take it to my boss for the for the conversation with them. If my boss would say, sorry, Stella, I'm terribly sorry that you've got other things you need to do this quarter, because look at the company level OKRs. I could take a view. I might just do that OKR anyway. Um, or maybe I wouldn't, and maybe I would. We would iterate and come up with a with a negotiated set of OKRs. But then the next quarter, I'm going to come back with what it what 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 my proposal was for my OKRs, um, and I'm more likely to do it and to get it to bought into at that point. So Google used this OKR process to try integrate top down where are we going from an organisation and what's the next bit of the train track, and bottom up what people wanted to work on and what their proposals for their work and priorities would be for the next quarter ahead. This is how the system held together and how we created enough freedom in the system to drive that autonomy, creativity, that kind of environment that I've been talking about without it being just abject chaos, without people just doing what the hell they liked, which of course would be a recipe for, for a ticket to nowhere. Um, so it was this OKR process that really held it all together. Um, for managers, there's something very specific that went on for managers as well with this. So managers, um, um, were there was this time in the organization that the founders believed we should, didn't need managers. They were just useless um, bureaucratic um, paper shufflers. We didn't need managers and they got rid of managers. Um, 
And the analytics folks had to very quickly demonstrate that actually managers had utility. There was value in having managers. And moreover, good managers really made a difference. They drove OKR fulfillment, they drove productivity, they drove happiness for their uh, uh, team members. So there was a big project that was done called Project Oxygen, which was what is it about managers? What are the differentiating features about managers? And um, this is um, this was what was called Project Oxygen. Um, it's all in the public domain now. It's a HBR case. You can find it on Harvard Business Review. Um, and Google did a very thorough and analytical exercise with control groups norming um, for you know type of function, type of employees, ten years, all this kind of stuff, um, and which groups. Uh, were more productive and more effective um, and um, had higher levels of OKR fulfillment than those. And what was it about the managers? And they came up with these eight differentiating attributes, um, which in many ways are nothing unusual. <laughs> There's no like, um, ta-da, they're the kinds of things you would expect. Be a good coach, empower your team, be interested in them, be results oriented, be a great communicator, listen, help them with their career development, have a clear vision and strategy. They're not, but what was important was this wasn't some guru who'd written, you know, a book um, who'd come up with these characters. This was real data from Google about which teams and which managers were more effective. And so this became then um, a set of um, criteria by which you know, we would um, develop managers and develop this kind of manager capability as well, and also use that in terms of the expectations for managers in the organization. So let's go a little further. Um, communication, um, and specifically open communication. I touched on this a little bit earlier on. So the culture in the organization was the default positions to share everything. Share as much as you can. We want to share what's happening in our projects and our work, what's working, what isn't working. We want to default to open. And that's quite a contrast to some other organizations. You know, the old paradigm of knowledge is power, so I'm going to keep it to myself. Um, quite the opposite. We want to share and spread as much knowledge as possible. So default to open. So managers really need to be routers, you know, not information hoarders, but routers. We want to make the connections and share the relevant information to one, one another across the organization. And there are a couple of practices to help with this. Um, one of which is a thing called TGIF. Thank God it's Friday, which curiously happened on Thursday afternoon, which was a Q&A session, there's a picture of it up here on the screen, on the stage in at the main office in Mountain View. The founders, or at least some of the exec team, on stage every Thursday afternoon, no matter what, come hell or high water, they would be there um, to do an update and to talk about what's going on and to open themselves up to take serious Q&A, to open themselves up to challenge um, and to questions as to in these things could be sometimes they're quite trivial, um, but mostly they were pretty profound. What are we doing about privacy concerns or what's the position um, in relation to our products in China or these kinds of questions? Um, and it was just a fantastic example of open communication that then got disseminated down into the organization. Um, so TGIFs and as the company scaled, one reason they did them on Thursday afternoon was they they um, well they live streamed them, but secondly they videoed them so people in their remote offices that were at, um, you know it was nighttime there they could watch them the following morning. Q and A worked with a Q and A early Q and A poll. Anybody could ask questions. It got upvoted. The top questions got posed. No escape. Um, so TGIS became quite a thing. Um, OKRs that I've talked about already, those OKRs, whether it's company, team, or individual OKRs, what my OKRs are, were all accessible, shareable. Everybody could see them, not just what the OKRs were, but how well you've done on them. So the attainment on those OKRs. Um, there were two purposes. The main purpose for that was so people could see and you could search on keywords or projects what other people are working on. 
so you could foster this collaboration and partnering. So if you're working on something and I'm working on something, then we can figure that out and hopefully we work together on it. Or one of us stops, we deduplicate and we get on with something else. Um, so open communication. Okay, OKRs, people did snippets. So a week, at end of week, not long, one sentence, maybe two sentences. What's happened? What's happening next week? Again, posted, shareable across all to the whole organization. Things like calendar, visible to all, um, as much as possible to be open. Of course, there are, you know, company confidential, um, personal things. Of course, you wouldn't share these things. But the default position was share everything. Things should be open. So a very kind of rich and open communication um, internal comms and communication process in the organization. Let's come to learning then um, and growth. Um, and Daniel front ended this with some really interesting things about the need to continually learn. And I mean, that was true then, it's even more so, tr it's even truer now. Um, and the way Google thought about its, um, its kind of learning agenda and learning a gr growth agenda for its people with had to be very nuanced because, of course, the kind of people Google hired, super smart people who basically could do it for themselves. I mean, they could use either Google's products and services to access information, um, share information, um, synthesize information, um, or other products and services such as some of the ones that are on here. Um, so people are just natural learners in the organization and rather resistant to traditional programs and resources of one sort or another. Um, so learning really was in the flow of work. Um, and the main mechanism in Google um, over the years, and it evolved over the years, was to use and to leverage employees themselves in the learning process. Um, we created, we branded it as G to G, Googler to Googler, but it was essentially was a peer learning community. So we hire you, you've got some skill and expertise, that's great, that allows you to do your job, but we'd also like you to share it with your peers and with others. So we want to encourage people to share their knowledge and expertise. So they're not just going to be consumers of learning, but they're also going to be providers of learning. And this is what this G2G peer-to-peer peer -peer learning community um, was. Its origins were in Dublin, actually, with product training, product education for the sales force, um, where we got the PMs, the product guys themselves, involved in the process. And it grew to cover everything from senior level executive development, sales training, tech skills, manager skills, um, whatever. And the way that it worked is that we would either ask people, so we know you're great as a program manager or as a project manager, and we'll share your expertise with others, um, or people would elect to do it themselves. So actually we said, well, if you're passionate about something, share your expertise, even if it's something crazy and non-work related. Um, and G2G grew over the years as the primary vehicle for internal learning and education in the organization. The way it looked like was, was like this. So here's an example, a guy called Tom Uglo in London, who um, you know, asked to do a, a light tech course for non-engineers. Um, so we'd ask him to, to create this program and run this program. We would help him put it together. Then we have um, a lady in Dublin here, um, Emma Cassoni, who we used YouTube and rigged up an instance of YouTube, asked people to upload content onto this internal instance of YouTube, called it G2G TV, um, and to create these video based assets and resources as well as live programs. Um, so we would tap people on the shoulder and ask them to provide content and share it with others. Um, here's Here's an example of juggling. So who's a guy who was a professional juggler, going back to the Googliness, you know what marked him apart was he was in the circus before he joined Google. Um, so he wanted to run juggling classes for, um, for, for the organization. Fine, um, we're very happy to help him run juggling classes and that's what he wanted to do. And the fine and why that's okay was two things really. One was actually that kind of culture of learning and sharing 
Um, even if it's a non-work related topic, it's still driving and encouraging and nurturing that culture of learning and sharing and openness. Um, so that's fine. But secondly, what's really important is not what I say or what a boss says. What's really important is what the peers say, what the employees say. So all of these courses, resources, assets, learning assets of one sort or another were peer rated a bit like TripAdvisor or Amazon star ratings. So I might think I'm great running a communication skills course, but you know the truth now. You've seen me in action. So I might rate myself as a five star, but you would rate myself as a one or two star. And out of that would come a net recommender rating for me on delivering this, this program. So the good stuff would rise to the top in the eyes of their employees and the system would stand the lousy stuff would languish at the bottom um, and then we would start to know which resources and things were useful to people and so the system started to evolve and start to reach a bit life of its own this is how, how google thought about and how we went about most of our learning activities um, it grew from these kind of origins into um, this, uh, a thing called GWiz, which was a, a kind of a taxonomy and tagging engine. So I would tag my people could tag themselves with different skills and attributes. So then you could search on and find others who had those kind of skills and attributes. So this was a, a, an internal product called GWiz um, that allowed skills tagging, that allowed you then to hear some examples of people on here. So we know that Guido there um, was pretty good in Python. Um, and Guido could say, well, you know, I, I'm happy to um, run a course on this, run a workshop, or maybe not. Uh, I'm happy to be a mentor to somebody in this or a peer coach to somebody in this topic. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Or I'm just available for Q&A. So I'm in the, available for in the moment performance support. So you've got a problem just ping me on instant message and I'll respond. So it wasn't just about courses and resources. It was also about mentoring and coaching. And it was also about in the moment Q&A as well. So this thing evolved and grew. Um, we took learning and really tried to drive it into the fabric of the organization. This is real. You'll probably recognize places like this, you know, the, the washrooms, the toilets. Um, in the washrooms and in the toilets, we had a thing called learning on the loo. Um, it wasn't created by management or by the HR team. It was created by employees themselves. They put a little, here's what here's here's a tip sheet on managing meetings. It might have been managing meetings, it might have been Python coding, it might have been um, digital marketing. Put a little uh, sheet of tips and ideas on the back of the doors in every loo around the world and cycled them in, in a, you know, and um, there would be a fresh, a new tip sheet, a new topic every week. Learning on the loo existed as well. So we, took, we tried to take learning really into the fabric of the organization. Um, it existed for career advice and mentoring as well. We had a career, a career advisor network um, across the organization for more experienced people to give their advice, guidance, mentoring to more junior people across the organization. So we worked hard to create this environment um, and um, we got recognized. We made the press um, Business Insider. Um, this was back in 2012. You know, 11 amazing things we all can learn for free. Actually, it was more than 11, it was like a, <laughs> thousands of things they could do. But still, it was nice for Business Insider to pick up this stuff. So it was a really rich environment, really rich environment for, for learning. Um, so that's the kind of tour of the estate of Google and how Google tried to think about these things. Um, I think, um, you know, I left Google six years ago and we'll come on to some more recent things now. But I think some of my takeaways are on this chart here, you know, um, to be very intentional about the company culture and the kind of environment that you want. Um, that this, this notion of leadership at all levels is really what's important. It's the quality of people's thinking that really is important, not positional power. I mean, of course, you have senior people. You need senior people in the organ. Somebody needs to make decisions. Somebody needs to apportion resources, um, whether that's budget or headcount. Um, um, somebody needs to take a strategic and longer term view. But it's that positional power is not the essence of it 
What's important is the quality of people's thinking. This notion of freedom within a framework, you know, you need to give people autonomy and freedom to allow them to innovate and express themselves to be able to drive creativity. But it has to sit within a framework. If you don't provide a framework, you would just have abject chaos um, and things wouldn't align and fit together. So this notion of freedom within a framework and Spotify, we'll talk about Spotify in a moment. Spotify have this notion of limited blast radius. It's a really interesting idea. So what is the blast radius of an idea? Because you need to limit the blast. If you don't want something that's going to take the whole system down if it, if it, if it fails. So the, the degrees of freedom with which you give things is really critically important. Um, you want to give people guidance and priorities. You want to give them coaching and mentoring. This notion of OKRs, focus on a few key things each quarter, apply 70, 20, 10. Managers are key. This 20% time, enough time for ideation, experimentation, but move fast and learn the lessons and move on. So I, I think those are some of the pieces for me from Google. Um, now, this has been a bit of a Google kind of tour of the estate, intentionally so, because I wanted, it was a large part of my experience, and I wanted to give you some insights into what that world was like um, and how we thought about it. But of course, <laughs> Google is not everything, um, far from it. Um, this is a nice little slide uh, from uh, a real slide. You know, there are questions that can't be answered by Google. Um, and it is what it is. It's a case study. It's a set of good practices that have evolved over time for Google. It's not a set of best practices. And there are many other companies in the tech world is a nice vibrant slide of Silicon Valley from a few years ago. And it's not just Silicon Valley, but there are many other. If you remember those waves I talked about earlier on, right at the beginning of this, there are the next gen companies on the horizon. And, you know, kind of companies, some of which are on this slide, you know, some of the ones that I've worked with, but there are plenty of others. And what I thought I'd like to do in the kind of latter half of this session now is, so Google is one thing, as I said, and, and we can come back to it in Q&A if you'd like. Um, and it offers some great, great good practices um, and some great case studies. Um, but so there are in many other organizations as well. And there's a couple of messages I want to reinforce. So there's two other places I want to go. Um, first of all, I want to take you to SoundCloud. Um, and, you know, the idea, so Google is one thing, but there are others who are doing very similar things um, and others doing very similar kinds of things and building very similar kind of environments for their digital creatives um, outside of the US. Good. Um, and there are two European examples I want to share with you now. So SoundCloud are interesting. I'm sure many of you have heard of or come across or are users of SoundCloud. They're a Berlin based startup. I'll scale up now. They've been on the scene for a while. Um, and they're really, really super interesting. Um, as an example of another organization that's created an environment that is similar but different to that Google environment. Different in that it's unique enough for their own culture and climate and business that they're in, but still holds many of the same kind of tenants as that as that Google environment did. Um, so I want to show you a clip um, of what it's like in SoundCloud. And I want to remind you of that clip I shared 20 minutes ago or so of Google. If you remember some of what that what was in that clip about the environment in Google, just have that in the back of your mind as you look at this clip um, about the SoundCloud world. So if we could roll this, roll this, please. We used to say we won't get older and we are all right. We wait to change and then it's over. What we're doing, what we're creating with SoundCloud and the product and the company goes way beyond a company. You feel a lot when you listen to music and audio. And if you believe that that's something that's significant for the world, 
then this is the place where you can be part of transforming the world of music and audio and do it with really amazing people. All those dreams we know We can take this road The thing we're building is up there in the cloud, right? So it's virtual, it's kind of a shapeless thing. This is physical. And you kind of know that there's something special going on there. You come in and you see there's another layer in here that's just magical. We've gotten strange, we've gotten older. Right. I really like my colleagues. But it's really great to be here because I've been given a chance. Uh, like I was very junior when I joined SoundCloud. Like it's always great to uh, come into the office. You always learn, you always learn something new. Something about the SoundCloud offices was the way that meeting spaces and play spaces were mixed. So there could be people playing ping pong while someone was conducting an interview. And it really feels more like a cafe where you can meet and have a casual conversation or have a work conversation and they kind of blend. There is no layer of we need to do things a certain way or we're forced to do things a certain way as opposed to just saying, yeah, I have this crazy idea and maybe I'll just bring it up with my team and maybe it'll just happen. And that's something that you don't you don't sort of see very often. And that's, that's really interesting. So what's unique about people that work here is that People are exceptionally talented, like they're really, really smart, really great people that are on top of their game, but they're really human at the same way. That's why I work here. Another little propaganda video, this time from SoundCloud. Um, but I, I said originally with that Google video, it was intentional that I showed it. It was intentional, one, to illustrate the Google culture, but also to contrast it to this one. Um, so this one is very similar in, it, in the sense that it's there to try and um, you know, open and share and encourage people to want to be part of the SoundCloud story. And so it talks a lot about the culture and the environment there. And it's so similar to the Google one. I mean, this really strong mission and purpose. Um, several times, amazing people, the quality of people that we have in this organization, super talented people, but really people that you want to be a part with, people that would pass the LAX test, people that you want to be with, that are, you know, not just talented, but are great people to be, you know, to be interacting with and being mixing with. Um, the environment, yes, the physical environment, but much more than just the physical environment, the whole way of working in environment. Um, autonomy, so the ability to have the kind of freedom within the, the, in the context of your work and in the context of your job role. Such similar cultural dimensions. One might think that this was some little facsimile or offshoot of, of Google, but it has nothing to do with Google. Um, the founders um, didn't come from Google, were never employed by Google. Um, the context is entirely different. The Berlin-based SoundCloud um, in, the, in the music industry, and yet they've ended up in a very, very similar place, um, attracting similar kinds of digital creatives into their organization, creating an environment where those digital creatives thrive and retaining those digital data uh, natives within an organization. So I would argue that, and there are many others, I'm just using SoundCloud here because I because I know them a little um, from my work with them. Um, but it's not just the Google or Silicon Valley data point. This stuff is also resonant here in Europe as well, and indeed around the world. And it's these kinds of environments are the ones that would really um, foster creativity, innovation, ongoing learning, um, and provide the kind of conditions and climate where digital creatives can 
be their true authentic selves and do the best work that they can um, and have the time of their working lives. So um, I want to show you another European example, um, and that's Spotify. And there's, there's a point that I really want to emphasize. Um, I talked about a little bit earlier on about how in Google and in other organizations like Spotify, um, what's really important is this notion of, of the fast beat the slow, um, but learn the lessons quickly and move on. And so, you know, that culture of learning is really important. And a really important component of that is failure and what happens with failure and how failure is handled. You know, if failure is stigmatized and seen as a bad thing, then you really kill learning and you kill innovation in an organization. You know, if we're going to have an environment of experimentation, then things will naturally fail. Um, what we need to do is to be able to identify that early, share the lessons, abstract from that, move on. Um, and S Spotify, Spotify is an interesting company in all sorts of ways, but I think specifically this notion of how you handle failure in an organization is critical to this kind of environment here. And it's really a kind of like an extreme use case or extreme example of, of a culture of learning. I want to share with you this video. It's, I think it's super powerful um, and is really a kind of like a provocation uh, in terms of the kind of environment we want to create in organizations. So if we can roll this video. I'd like to talk about failure. Our founder, Daniel, put it nicely. We aim to make mistakes faster than anyone else. Yeah, I know, sounds a bit crazy, but here's the idea. To build something really cool, we will inevitably make mistakes along the way, right? But each failure is also a learning. So when we do fail, we want it to happen fast so we can learn fast and therefore improve fast. It's a strategy for long-term success. It's like with kids. You can keep a toddler in the crib and she'll be safe, but she won't learn much and won't be very happy. If you instead let her run around and explore the world, she'll fail and fall sometimes but she'll be happier and develop faster. And the wounds, well, they usually heal. So Spotify is a fail-friendly environment. We're more interested in fast failure recovery than failure avoidance. Our internal blog has articles like celebrate failure and stories like how we shot ourselves in the foot. Some squads even have a fail wall where people show off their latest failures and learnings. Failing without learning is, well, just failing. So when something goes wrong, we usually follow up with a post-mortem. This is never about whose fault was it. It's about what happened? What did we learn? What will we change? Postmortems are actually part of our incident management workflow. So an incident ticket isn't closed when the problem is solved. It's closed when we've captured the learnings to avoid the same problem in the future. Fix the process, not just the product. In addition, all squads do retrospectives every few weeks to talk about what's working well and what to improve next. All in all, Spotify has a strong culture of continuous improvement, driven from below and supported from above. However, failure must be non-lethal or we don't live to fail again. So we promote the concept of limited blast radius. The architecture is quite decoupled. So if a squad makes a mistake, it will usually only impact a small part of the system and not bring everything down. And since the squad has end-to-end -end responsibility for their stuff without handoffs, they can usually fix the problem fast. Also, most new features are rolled out gradually, starting with just a tiny percent of all users and closely monitored. Once the feature proves to be stable, we gradually roll it out to the rest of the world. So if something goes wrong, it normally only affects a small part of the system for a small number of users for a short period of time. This limited blast radius gives squads courage to do lots of small experiments and learn really fast, instead of wasting time trying to predict and control all risk in advance. Mario Andretti puts it nicely. If everything's under control, you're going too slow. <laughs> so hopefully that was um, uh, an interesting little video clip. And, and I think for me, it's, it's I mean, there are other organizations. I mean, lots of, you know, lots of organizations are agile and run in scrubs and do retros and do retrospectives. And it's just part of the agile methodology. But nobody, I think, that I'm aware of anyway, goes so far to make such bold 
statements as you know we want to create a culture of you know a failure in the organization it's okay to fail um in fact it's to be celebrated um and now you know you can argue well that's all very well but you know at a certain point serial failure needs to be dealt with i mean you'll bring the whole system that's true there are boundaries to all of this of course but still you know the kind of if you're going to have a launch and iterate um, and move fast culture and environment and give people freedom, um, then stuff is not going to work, um, and it's unreasonable to expect everything to work. In fact, if you do expect everything to work, you're not going to get any innovation or creativity. People are going to be drones and just be told what to do. Um, so that balance, that tension, is really, really critical and important. So I think um, I'm going to bring this to a close now, and um, uh, it would be great um, to have some question. I know we've got time for Q and A and so on, um, but I want to kind of have a, I have a few kind of closing remarks and things before we get to that. And um, I, I wanted to um, kind of bring all of this together with one or two final thoughts. Um, first of all, the kind of some thoughts around people nowadays, you know, modern learner. Um, hopefully some of the people, all of you uh, on the, uh, uh, who are listening in right now, you know, things have changed. You know, people don't necessarily need to know anything anymore. Um, what people need to know is how to know. Um, and so actually, you know, the knowledge skills, experience you might have might be very useful, but probably what's even more useful is a higher level of abstraction. So how can you learn new things or how can you access new things? So it's it's knowing how to know. And I think there are three levels of abstraction to this or three ways of thinking about this that I would urge people to think about. The first and most obvious is, um, and everybody does this, of course, is to just Google it or to search on YouTube or whatever, you know, so people sourcing and create and curating the expertise they need in the moment and a lot of this of course is just passive and in the background is just how we live our lives nowadays but as you think about the working context as well you want to create the kind of conditions and, and climate where people are just googling it as well um, so give, treat people like adults um, they ought to know what they need to know for their roles. If they don't, they should talk to their bosses and have some coaching from their bosses. But you need to provide access for people to be able to resources for people to just Google it. Then this notion of a swarm. So to harness the collective expertise of people around you. Um, and the obvious one is your team. But this kind of swarm, like it's not just your team. It's also other people within the organ, not just your direct team. You want to develop a bit of a swarm like mentality. So how can you crowdsource and harness the expertise um, of others that are around you? If you think back to the G to G strategy and system that we built at Google, it was all based on tapping the collective intelligence of other employees, other Googlers within the system. Um, generally speaking, in most organizations, somebody somewhere knows or can do something that you need to know or you need to be able to do you just need to be able to access it so there's a kind of at the level of the individual you know so i need to have the skills to be able to just google it and to curate and source expertise i need to reach laterally and think about people around me and, that, and to be able to crowdsource and harness the expertise the collective wisdom of the team and then also beyond that as well, I would argue that it goes beyond the immediate boundary of whatever entity you're in, whether it's a company or a academic institution or whatever, but the kind of ecosystem like dynamics. So there's a broader level of abstraction. So how can you tap into intelligence, insight, knowledge um, within other entities as well? Um, I think within that then, um, the other thing, and I mentioned it already in talking about managers, um, honest, data-based, authentic feedback. Um, there's a whole movement around radical candor. There's a great book, um, Radical Candor. Um, honest, objective, direct, actionable feedback. People need it um, to be able to respond and evolve and adapt, and they also need 
coaching support as well. And that's where, of course, the role of the managers and that role of, if you remember the Project Oxygen thing from Google, the role of the manager to provide scaffolding in all of this is critically important. Um, in fact, somebody recently in Facebook um, I was talking to, we were talking about their culture in Facebook, and they said, well, there is no such thing really as a, fa as a Facebook culture. What that actually is, is a patchwork quilt of little micro cultures in this organization. Each one of those managers and team leads sets the conditions and climate within their teams. They set that these little micro cultures and the overall organizational culture is just an aggregation of all of these little patchwork quilt of micro cultures. It's those managers, those managers who either create the conditions for you to have the best time of your life, to be the most innovative, creative, have the most fulfilling work experience you have, or have the lousiest work experience you're ever going to have in your life. It's those managers and team leads that are really critical in this thing to provide that kind of scaffolding. So I think they're things that skills and kind of outlooks that individuals need to have. They need to have feedback and interaction with their peers and they need to have support from the, within the organization. And finally, really, um, I want to close with, you know, people sometimes think, well, all of this is all fine for tech companies, of course. Um, but I would argue that all companies are tech companies nowadays. I mean, of course, some are digital natives, and, and but even you know, the large traditional businesses need to think this way, and generally speaking, are beginning to move and think this way. Because if they don't think of themselves as tech companies, sooner or later they're going to get eaten by the multitude of little fish that are going to that are going to um, <laughs> pick off the prof profitable products and services of what they do, and leave behind the unprofitable or the low margin ones, and their businesses will, will flounder and, and falter. So they need to think of themselves as tech companies and need to start thinking about handling their employees and creating the conditions and climate that we've talked about. You know, those little companies, the tech scale ups and startups that we're trying to encourage and support and incubate, you know, are on the tail of the big fish, you know, for their business, for their users and for their people. So everybody needs to think about some of these, not best practices, but good practices from these kinds of organizations and think about how they can um, integrate them into their into their worlds and into the way they think about their organizations. Um, one final thing, of course, this year, 2020 has been quite a year with COVID. <laughs> um, and, you know, a lot of organizations, this slide is really resonant for me, you know, a lot of organizations had great plans and intentions at the beginning of this year. And this quote from Mike Tyson is a, is a great quote, you know, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Um, and this year has felt like that for many, many sectors, businesses, people, you know, all of the great intentions and plans that were at the beginning of the year, we've had to deal with a massive punch in the face and be able to react very, very quickly. Um, some have been more successful than others in doing this. The future is highly ambiguous. We don't know quite what and how this is going to land, if ever it will land. But our ability to be able to deal with those punches in the face are going to be really determinants of long run success for many organizations and businesses. The ability to be agile, um, to be able to pivot quickly, to be able to reapportion resources, to be able to change their business model, um, to be agile at that kind of level, to deal with big discontinuities in the environment. And then with their employees, employees need to have the right kind of mindset, um, to have faith in, the, in their business leaders, in the mission and purpose of their organization, have a growth mindset that actually that they're going to have to change potentially the roles that they do, the work that they do, how they go about their ways of work. That kind of that kind of individual level agility, all of these this kind of environment that I've talked about so far in these kinds of organizations build that kind of muscle, that kind of agility muscle. And so 
in a world of big dust continuities, whether it's COVID, whether there are other major challenges on the horizon and discontinuity, which there could well be, um, not far off with um, many new technologies, impact of climate change, geopolitics. Um, there's so many big potential step changes and ambiguities that we don't know about. We need to have the ability to be able to handle these kinds of punches um, and to be able to make sure we don't end up on the floor, but we can take a step back, pivot fast and reorientate ourselves and bring our people with us in that. So my final piece is, um, is I want to end with a quote, a very old quote. And it, and it kind of plays to this last point. You know, this is a quote from Charles Darwin from many centuries ago now. Um, it's not the strongest of the species of su survive. It's not the highest performance. It's not the smartest. It's not the most intelligent that survives. It's the ones that are most adaptive to change. And to this point about this last slide, um, big step changes or maybe longer range changes. It's that kind of organizational adaptivity and agility that's going to make the difference. And the kinds of environments and conditions that we've talked about um, to foster creativity and innovation in an organization gives you much of that kind of adaptivity and organizational agility. So that's where I want to leave it. Um, I hope this has been interesting for people um, and um, and the, some of the insights and shorty, stories and war stories um, uh, that I've um, that I've covered. And um, we've got some time for questions now, I believe. Um, so. Stefan, thank you so much. We're going to get to questions in just a second, but first I'm going to reserve my right to deploy some radical candor and say <laughs> that that was absolutely fascinating thank you so much i learned so much and that's precisely what jersey tech week is all about the ideas the diversity of thought the innovation has been brilliant i think it's wonderful being given the opportunity to look at what everybody on the island is doing in terms of the uh, the green agenda as well as in the digital space what we really need to do is get some of these ideas in front of the state of jersey some of the government officials and show them that we can make some incremental small steps to head towards our target of 2030 being carbon neutral. OK, let's pick on pick up on some of the things we've been absolutely spellbound by over the past couple of hours. So Stefan should still be with us. There he is, yes, sir, resplendent yeah. in your giant plasma screen. And Daniel back with us as well. We're going to just talk about you, first of all, Stefan, before we get to some questions. Daniel, I know you've heard some of this before because you wisely invite this man in to, to educate the students that you're working with as well. There's so much to learn from what we've just heard of the last 90 minutes. I think the great thing about Stefan's presentation is not only is it very clever, but it's actually hugely applicable and it's very, very practical. And I love presentations that leave you things that you can take away. And that's what I've always been impressed with Stefan's presentation. So I think there's a huge amount of practical tips in there that organisations of any size can take away and, and apply. OK, I'm going to start with uh, one of the themes of the questions and, and you, can, you can both have a bite on this. But Stefan, I'll start with you. You know, we, this all boils down much of what you're saying uh, about company culture, that culture affecting so many other things. How, how does a business that's rooted very much in the it's always been done this way game get to the kind of thing that you're describing where perhaps there's free food and you're encouraged to bring your pet to work. <laughs> there are a number of routes to that. Um, um, either I think the best route to it is to experiment, is to find some small places and spaces to play in an organisation, whether it's a project team or a function or an office where you try things differently um, and you can create some exit criteria. So in other words, so, so you want to measure or have some KPIs to measure the impact of doing things differently in an organization. So I think if you can't demonstrate impact of doing things differently, you're you're not going to deal with some of that latent traditional thinking that you have in the kind of organization I think you're suggesting. 
Daniel, just get some thoughts from you on this one, because I, 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 I just get the impression it is, it is something that people are, are really aware of, but, but taking the first step is perhaps the most daunting part of that journey. It is, and I think maybe COVID, we talked about digital transformation in early, earlier sessions and talked about you know, the acceleration of that. Quite often the argument we make is that a lot of organisations that are looking at this and saying, oh, you know, it's great this stuff, but it's not for us, we do things and we're fairly successful. At some point or another, if they don't adapt to the environment they're operating in, they will fail. So going back to that that kind of Darwin quote at the end there is very much that they need to adapt and that might be with small experiments, it might be that a bit of shock and awe needs to come in to kind of shake things up, but change is inev inevitable and I think these are the principles that help you do that. When it comes to peer-to-peer -peer learning, it, it, it strikes me this happens in lots of workplaces in a very informal way if the employer doesn't ever speak of g to g or p to p or whatever letter or number you choose to to add to your moniker when it comes to formalizing that what, what are your best tips the pair of you for actually getting that process formally on the table so people accept not just a that this ha is happening and b that it's expected but c that everyone can extract some value out of doing so yeah, shall I say some words first? Please do. Um, um, yeah. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, it goes on informally all the time in organisations. And um, uh, so, you know, there's never an organisation or a context or a climate where learning isn't happening. Of course, it's happening. I mean, all, every day and all the time. I mean, most work is learning of one sort or another. Um, but the trick to kind of make, I wouldn't say formalising, what I would say is legitimising it. Mm -hmm. um, and so making it okay to actually you know go out of your way to either participate you know as a consumer of learning or as a contributor of learning it needs to be legitimized so it needs to be okay to do this and not be you know on, on top of the workload and expectations so it needs to sit in people's you know goals and objectives they need to get feedback on it there needs to be a component of however they get rewarded in the organization um excellence needs to be recognized um we need to make a, a nice you know kind of like um, um uh, kind of recognition awards this kind of stuff you need to help people with this but it needs to be legitimized in these kinds of ways that's i think what helps getting it over the line Daniel, you, you referred to this a little bit earlier when you were talking to us as well about the difference between organisations where they go, do you know what, all our employees have just had a 15 minute online course, we've done our training for 2020, aren't we marvellous? And then there are others who, who get it and realise actually going through the motions is not the answer. Yeah, I think we've all been institutionalised to some extent. I mean, we see this of our students coming out of school and when you say to them, right, we're going to learn something, now you're going to sit and discuss it and debate it and present it back. Um, and those of you who didn't get it, you can learn from those around you. They're kind of like, oh, they, he realises some of us didn't get it. And, and that's kind of OK. And I think it's very much is about enablement, but very much also about saying we need the culture. And we keep coming at this culture word because of it. So I think, you know, we, we can sell a, a learning product into an organisation. Doesn't mean they're going to use it. Doesn't mean that essentially um, they're going to encourage the use of it. It's kind of a box ticking exercise. And I think that starts at school. And I think we've got to organisations, education and so on have got to adapt to that. I, I was really. Can I, can I just add to that? Oh, please actually, do. I, I, I really, really do agree. I think it is a generational shift. We've got to, we've got to think about, you know, what's going on in the schools, so that you know that that's where it will start and feed up into what you know. You can play in organisations and potentially change things, but really, you know, the end game here is that it's a generational change. We need to start in the schools, absolutely. Which puts the pressure on you, Daniel, because the digital leadership program at the Digital Jersey Academy is in full flow. I know. The, the latest cohort are there working hard all the time and learning collaboratively and of course from you and the people you bring in how do you embed that culture in them so that in effect they become ambassadors for this way of thinking you have to start by just being honest and saying the way you've learned up to now is not how we're going to learn from going on and I actually we think it was wrong which is a bit of a shock to, to a lot of them yeah um, and also then saying right you're going to be assessed not only on your results in the exam, and actually we don't do a single exam, so we, we don't find exams useful. There's no other point in your life where you're going to walk into a room and be shut off from the rest of the world and recite things that are in your brain. Um, so the reality is we assess in different ways, and we start by saying you will be assessed by your peers on what they thought of your presentation, not just what we thought of it. And th there's a whole load of kind of assessment methodologies that you can use to do that. You can still be very, very rigorous in your academic approach. Um, you just don't have to revert to sitting people down, giving them an exam to tick a box, and it's lazy teaching in my opinion. Let's talk failure. 
<laughs> that stops everyone in their tracks. Um, it, I, I was fascinated. I think it was the Spotify video you, you played talking about failing fast. And it really reminded me of, uh, of two big, well-known broadcasters I've worked for in recent years. Now, I won't name names. One of whom, if you wanted to even change the time of the lunch break by five minutes, set up a working party to consider the idea for three months and then report back to senior management with some recommendations. Uh, the upshot, of course, is that NAFL changed. Uh, the, the other broadcaster that I, I may currently work with actually says do you know what it sounds good go with it and if it doesn't work we'll have learned from it as long as we make different mistakes each time let's fail fast does that really make a matter it make, make a difference when it comes to, to the culture of a business daniel massively i mean i think you need the metrics in the background i mean i think exactly as stefan has spoken about you can't do this in this free form kind of chaotic way but if you've got the metrics to do something and then go did it work or didn't it because we know what we're aiming to achieve and then iterate. And when we teach something like digital marketing, all the word I say every third word is iterate, do it, learn, test, improve, and just keep going through that cycle. But it does change the culture because it means people will try things. And then I also accept that they don't know everything because you've got this, there was a, a great thing um, that I think came out of Google as well. And it was talking about using this iteration to remove hippos. And that was the idea that you were removing the highest paid people's opinions. <laughs> so there's all these very subjective yeah. things like like web design and, and it was like, well, the button should be there and it should be blue and so on. And it's like, actually, that's just your opinion. Let's test it. Let's prove it. And let's say no one app has actually got, you know, there, there are experts in the business, but there's a lot of opinion based stuff. Let's prove if it's an opinion or it's a fact. So actually, never mind yeah, hippos. They're, they're, they're the elephants in the room, Stefan. Yeah, there's two things that I just want to kind of that will resonate with me or I want to amplify this, this thing about opinions. That's right. I mean, a lot of hippos or senior folks generally have, have opinions about things, but very not necessarily facts and data to support their assertions. So I think, you know, having a, a, a you know, a climate and uh, the latitude in an organization to be able to say, no, that's just not good enough. You know, you need to have the data to support, you know, whatever um, hypothesis that you have. I and mean, that's the right approach. That's how you move. And so, so, you know, data is really important to remove the hippos from the room. If you have the hippos in the room who will just have a series of opinions, well, that's really gonna, gonna kill any kind of innovation in an organization. Um, the other thing that's just on my mind before I lose it though, and, and Daniel, you just said it there around, you know, having some KPIs. Um, so you know what constitutes, you know, success or failure, absolutely. Um, but for me, there's a really important nuance between are you are we talk are we talking about you know kind of like fulfillment of activities so in other words we're going to do xyz and success or failure with those things or are we talking about outcomes so you know what is it that we're trying to achieve because if you talk about outcomes and try and rate success or failure with outcomes it maybe you've got the wrong set of activities and maybe there are another way to maybe there's another route to deliver the kind of outcomes that you want if you go to activities you're really locking down what's being done and you're not creating the space to try alternative approaches. Goodness. Yeah. I think that's a really interesting point because when we talk digital transformation, we were doing this a couple of days ago at Imperial College and what came out was like, well, a lot of digital transformation is about making the organization more efficient at doing what they already do. Whereas the big missing piece is that actually there should be a, maybe are other things we should be doing outside of that as well. And mm -hmm. that's where the constant innovation and all the scaffolding yes. of innovation you've spoken about comes into things as well. Yes, yes, that's right. Right. A question which is asking for specifics from the pair of you. So I want none of this broad brush nonsense. I demand specifics. What specific communication tools can help drive engagement, collaboration and innovation? Make your product pitches now. Daniel, do you want to start on this one? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a load of stuff that's come out, um, particularly in COVID, where suddenly everyone's working remotely and they've learned ways of doing it. I mean, we've all moved. We, we're on Microsoft Teams anyway. Um, we tie Zoom in with that. Um, all of those video lectures and interactions then go on to Microsoft Stream in this particular use, particular case. Google have got all their equivalent products in Google Classroom and Hangouts and all that kind of stuff as well. Um, it just depends on the organization, but we get a bit hung up on the, the tools a lot of the time. I think a lot of the time it's about working out what we want to achieve, but those are the ones that we use in this specific case. Okay, and this I was going to, I was going to say go through your stellar background of products that you know you can recommend, but we've only got the next ten minutes. So Stefan, over to no, you. No, no. <laughs> um, 
So, so, so first of all, I agree, tools are tools. I mean, so, you know, and whether you use Microsoft Suite ones or Google Suite ones or others, I mean, tools are tools. Um, having said all of that, there's one that I think is, that's really impressed me in the last 12 months or so. It's been, and particularly in COVID times, has been super helpful to work collaboratively um, across time and space, and that's Miro, M-I-R-O, Miro boards. Um, it's a, basically a virtual infinite canvas that allows you to do brainstorming and prioritization and Kanban boards and all this kind of stuff. Miro is a pretty cool tool. Um, abstracting up from that a bit, um, the other thing that I, my initial response when I was listening to that question is, you, is OKRs. You need an OKR system, actually, um, some way of aligning for across the levels in the organization from what the company is trying to do and their objectives down to a team level, down to an individual level. You want alignment in that way and you want prioritization um, and you want iteration. So, you know, you, you want to be able to iterate fast. So an OKR type process will give you most of what you're looking for there. Thank you very much for that, Stefan. Uh, I want to touch on lifelong learning now. I, I think back to my school days, and I'm not going to timestamp those for anybody's benefit. Let's just say it was five minutes ago, obviously. Uh, but I could not wait to leave school. The, the second education was over. That was the end of my education. I would never need to learn another thing again in my life. Now, we all know that is absolute tosh. Is there a generational divide, though? Do we have a new generation coming through where this lifelong learning is just how it is? Uh, and is there, I mean, I'll call myself an, an old guard who perhaps need to get with the game for, for fear of being left behind? Daniel? I certainly think there is in terms of younger people knowing they have to constantly learn because what they're learning, they know it's out of date because of their own social media experiences or whatever else it might be. So they're kind of acceptant of that. Um, I think if I look at digital transformations, you could generalize and you could say, actually, there are a group of people who are doing their career for 30 years. They are a pro or maybe much longer and they're approaching a, a point where they might be thinking about changing or retiring. Then to say, well, we're going to do this differently now um, causes a lot of resistance. And actually a lot of that resistance is, you know, we've done it like this for a long time. It's always worked and it's still working in many cases. And that's where the challenge comes, where there is something that's still working. But when you look at it, you know, that won't be the case forever. Yeah. And it's changing that mindset of the well I can just carry on doing what I'm doing in a and a, you know I'll be I'll be retired so I think there's a challenge in that but I think that's a generalization as well I think I've got plenty of people when we interview them coming to Imperial College or trying to come into the digital leadership program that actually don't have that mindset and that's young people as well so I think it's dangerous to generalize on demographics there are some general rules but I think just because the culture that young people have grown up in of constant change and its evolution of technology, they are more likely to adopt that way. And Stefan, I, I wonder whether the events of the past six to nine months have curiously helped in this area. Yep. Actually, lifelong learning, Gran who never went near the iPad, hadn't heard of mm. Zoom, suddenly, I mean, it's horrible that phrase of the silver surfer, but actually she, she's a dab and with the apps now and she's doing yep, the puzzles absolutely. all day. That's right. So it's been a forcing function. And, and I'm sorry, I just want to go back and reinforce something Daniel just said there. I couldn't agree more. There's a real danger in stereotyping. So generational shifts is just another one of those. Um, and it's not actually true. When you look at an, an, an individual level, you make some dangerous assumptions about people. Um, but still, um, exactly. COVID has really been an accelerant. It's put fuel on the uh, rocket fuel on the fire of what was going on anyway. And what was going on anyway was really interesting. I read something this morning, the World Economic Forum, you know, the Davos kind of, you know, forum lot report earlier this year, just pre-COVID, pre-COVID, okay, that in two years time, so by 2022, 42% of all roles are expected to change substantially because of technological change. So in two years, 42% of all roles in organizations are going to change. That was pre-COVID before what's happened now. <laughs> so there's a huge forcing function that's going on, um, you know, in, in, in business, but in society at large. So I think it will help. I mean, people just have to get with it. And you're right, my 87 year old mum, she's on Zoom. I mean, there's no way in the world she would have been on Zoom, <laughs> like in January, I mean, just no way. I mean, so, Yes. <laughs> Good thoughts. I'm, I'm glad to hear it. And, and I have to say apologies if I'm guilty of stereotyping at any point, but hopefully it helps spur the conversation. Uh, final thoughts from each of, each of you. Time is flying away with us. Let's let's bring this back to skills and to Jersey as well. Um, I'll, I'll start with Daniel only so I can give the final word to Stefan on this one. Uh, Daniel, 
How hopeful are you as we look towards 2021 and we, we see the digital skills strategy, we also see the newly published government plan that's going to be debated by politicians in the coming weeks. We see those skills in black and white there are high up on the political and policy agenda. How hopeful are you for this either when it comes to bridging that skills divide? I'm phenomenally hopeful. I mean, if we try to open something like the digital leadership program in London, it would have taken a huge amount more time to do that, I think, realistically. But we're able to get things done here quickly. And we've got something that's not just great uh, on a Jersey scale, it's great on a global scale. So we're really proud of that. And I think initiatives like that will demonstrate that the impact this can have. Stefan. Final thought yeah. from you. You can pick up on that point, but I also just want to widen this to distilling your best specific advice to Jersey right now. This little rock is packed with ambition, enthusiasm, mm. talent and energy. What can you bounce our way to take away at the end of this session? I, I agree. And, and well, so I, I do think you have some unique conditions in Jersey. Um, for all of those reasons that you just described, you know, you don't have the level of difficulty you would have of doing something like creating, you know, the digital Jersey kind of hub and academy that you have there in London. It would have been much more tortuous to do that. So it's easier to do it. Um, things just as I talked about in Google, things required scaffolding. I think you also require scaffolding in Jersey. So it's great that you've got this in place and you've got momentum building. Um, but it takes momentum. It takes some prodding and pushing along until it reaches a level of, you know, kind of like it gets a life of its own. So, you know, I would urge more and more of this kind of proactive type of these kind of interventions, whether it's things like this in Jersey Digital Week or more digital academies and so on, to until the point you reach the level of critical mass. But I'm really quite pretty, pretty optimistic around Jersey being able to cover a really unique proposition for itself in this in this you know digital economy. Do you know what? I think the Digital Jersey team are going to carve up that little bit of your answer <laughs> and throw it all over social media for the next few weeks to shout that to the world. What a great way to end this session. Daniel Rolls, thank you so much. Stefan Toma, thank you so much. I know I say it every time and sound like a stuck record, but it really has been an education. And when it comes to skills, that feels like an even more appropriate thing to say. Right, that is the end of day four of five for Jersey Tech Week, but it is far from the end of the story because tomorrow morning we're going to be talking about smart islands. Let's take a little look at what's on the agenda tomorrow. We start tomorrow morning bright and early by looking at digital twins and then we've got a, a focus on data collection and how telecoms infrastructure is making a difference. We'll be focusing on the United Nations Smart Sustainable Cities initiative. We'll also be checking in with the government of Jersey and get their policy perspective on how they're going to integrate smart islands and we've got much more to go through the course of the morning including a catch up with one of the chiefs of JT and then into the afternoon well, this is the one that I've really been looking forward to. We, we like to front load our weeks, but we also like to have a spectacular finish as well. And we do that in style with the launch of the Jersey Tech Awards. More categories than ever before, including two brand new categories. We'll also be taking a little look back on the week with Tony Moretta to reflect on that and revealing the winners of the Creative Design Challenge as well. So all of that to come tomorrow, nine o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the afternoon and I know I say it's all the time check out the website for all the details digital.je slash techweek and from me and all the team thank you for watching see you next time